I'm Cyrus Taylor. I'm uh, Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences at uh, Case Western Reserve. And uh, it's a real pleasure for me to welcome you uh, all here today. Uh, I recognize a number of you that are, are good friends in the audience and uh, others of you that uh, I, I hope yet to meet. Um, but in any case, uh, I, I really want to, to welcome you for uh, an event that uh, I'm very excited about and, um, and have been uh, eagerly awaiting uh, for, I guess, uh, well over a year now uh, since uh, uh, Gladys first shared uh, uh, parts of the manuscript of the book. So, um, uh, you've probably all seen the book at this point. Um, I, I think it's uh, a, a fabulous memorial to Forest on Matter, and something that I, I think we all can be very proud of. Now, the, the person behind the book is also extremely important uh, to the college, and, uh, and also in helping me as I was uh, becoming acclimated to life as a dean last year, and that's Gladys Haddad. And uh, Gladys, uh, has been associated with the university for uh, a year or two. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, you know, as I said, I, I've been very grateful in that, uh, you know, her careful attention to uh, the, the history of the institution and the way it's developed has been something that's been extremely helpful to me uh, in terms of understanding where we are and what our opportunities are for the future. Uh, without further ado, though, I'd like to turn it over now to Gladys to, to talk about um, uh, her book, and, and more importantly, about Forest Home Matter. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> well, welcome to you all. I'm very pleased to see so many of you, and and uh, you've waited along with me for a long time for this <laughs> occasion, and so it, it really is very special. I um, want to remind you that the motto, or if that's the correct word for this year's Alumni Weekend, is um, celebrating the past, embracing the future. And in, uh, when I met Barbara Snyder, the president of our university, I said to her, what a, what a very happy coincidence that you have come as the first woman of this university, and it intersects perfectly in time with the publication of Flora Stone Mather, daughter of Cleveland's Euclid Avenue and Ohio's Western Reserve. And she was very, she was very interested and very touched by that, but then so was I. <laughs> <laughs> this event has um, been memorable for me in the planning of it. And that is that I expressed a wish, and it was honored by Cyrus, uh, and that is that this would be one of several events, but this one I especially wanted to honor the Mather family, the members who are here, and I'm going to introduce them to you, and also the Flora Stone Mather alumni. Now, you're all very welcome, <laughs> but for those two groups, this is the special occasion that I I set aside for them. So I want to introduce the uh, family members and, um, and their relations, uh, relationships, I should say, to the family. And um, I'm going to begin with um, uh, Ted uh, McMillan and his wife Judith. Ted is a great grandson of Flora Stone Mather, grandson of S. Livingston Mather, the first son of Flora Stone Mather, and the son of Elizabeth McMillan. I want to have them both stand so that they can be recognized. And <laughs> <laughs> and I haven't seen Tom Offit come in. Where is he? Oh, there he is, right in front of me. <laughs> Sorry. Tom um, Offit uh, and his daughter Catherine. Um, Tom is uh, the husband of the late uh, Madeline Molly McMillan Offit, um, and she uh, is, has the same lineage as her brother, Ted McMillan. And I would like to have um, Tom and Catherine stand up. Catherine is the daughter of Molly and uh, Tom uh, McMillan Offit. 
<laughs> I also need to tell you that this uh, book, this biography, is dedicated to Molly. Uh, and the reason for that is that she really epitomized everything that Flora Stone Mather stood for. And um, when you have the opportunity to read the book, you will see what I mean in the many ways that Flora's life unfolds. Uh, those of you, especially those of you who know Molly, will immediately recognize a present day, uh, the 20th century uh, Flora Stone Mather in Molly. Uh, Denny Anderson is up here, and Denny is um, the great-grandson of Flora Stone Mather, the grandson of Philip, and the son of Molly Mather Anderson. <laughs> is Lucy here? Lucy! <laughs> the back row. Lucy Ireland Weller, she is the great-granddaughter of Elizabeth Ring Ireland Mather, who married, no? Granddaughter. Sorry, granddaughter, <laughs> I made you younger, sorry. It was okay. <laughs> married, um, uh, who was married to William Gwynne Mather. Stand up, Lucy. <laughs> All right. Now. The other group that I told you this was honoring is uh, the Flora Stone Mather alumni. And I would like to have them raise their hands if they all don't want to get up. Graduates of Flora Stone Mather College. Higher. Higher. <laughs> I myself am an alum of Flora Stone Mather College because I spent my junior year here. And uh, when I was here, Flora Stone Mather was a building. That's all. I mean, I never really questioned who Flora Stone Mather was, along with most of my classmates. Um, so today, as I talk to you about her, uh, you'll understand uh, what a long way we've come. Now, the book, the biography of uh, Flora is has been published by Kent State University Press. And I would like to have Will Underwood, the uh, director of the press, stand up, and along with Mary Young, who is the project <laughs> editor. <laughs> now, the, the first question I will raise with you is, um, how, when, and why Flora? Flora um, came into my life when I did my dissertation which was on social roles and advanced education for women in 19th century America. And I did a study of three Western Reserve institutions that offered advanced education for women. And they were Oberlin, that offered co-education, Lake Erie Female Seminary and College, that offered single sex education, and the College for Women at Western Reserve University, that was a coordinate college for women, coordinate to that for men, which was named a Delbert College. When I was doing my research, and particularly, of course, on the part about the college, I became very interested in what, yes, what Flora had done in terms of the, of the college. But then it occurred to me, what an interesting woman. And I, I thought, at that time, it was 1980, <laughs> that um, I wanted to do more work on her. And so that's the genesis of the biography uh, that I have been working on ever since. Now, you may say, that's a long time. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> it is a long time. <laughs> However, I, um, I continued my, my scholarship. And over that period of time, I did a number of things as I was moving through my research. And one of them was I presented at many professional meetings. My scholarship was uh, what I used uh, in, in presenting those papers. And the other thing I did was um, I did documentaries, three of them, on the Mather family. And um, that was a very interesting experience. And the way I got into it was because 
um, I was invited to do a, a, a documentary uh, on Samuel Mather for the dedication of the Samuel Mather Pavilion at uh, University Hospitals. And when they came to me and asked me about that, I said, no, no. I said, Flora? Flora is my subject. They said, never mind. Nobody knows more about the Mather family than you. You do it. <laughs> and I, I really did fall back, you know, and I said, I thought about it. I said, well, I have to think about it for just a bit. And um, I did. And then I thought, well, I, I must do, it for the biography I was planning, I had to do a lot of research on Samuel Mather. And so I agreed to do it. It was an extraordinary experience. And then I moved from that to do subsequent um, documentaries on Joan Ainsworth, where is she? <laughs> she was so involved with that uh, when she was here. Um, I did uh, a second one on uh, Samuel and Flora Stone Mather, Partners in Philanthropy. And then the third one was Flora Stone Mather, um, A Legacy of Stewardship. So that's what I've been doing all these years as I was moving along toward <laughs> completing, this, um, uh, completing this biography. Now, this biography was inspired by the letters that I found that were housed at the Western Reserve Historical Society. Um, two archives supplied me with the rich resources that enabled me to, to write this biography. The Western Reserve Historical Society and the Case Western Reserve University Archives. But at the Western Reserve uh, Historical so Society, they had letters. Flora's letters, letters that were written to Flora, letters that she wrote, and the letters were exquisite because they were all written by people who were very literate, who were very well educated, and it was a treasure of 19th century letter writing. It captured the period, and we call, historians call these primary source materials. And here I was in all these riches. I mean, I just spent I was in residence at the Western Reserve Historical Society <laughs> for years because it, <laughs> it took a long time, first of all, to read them, then to Xerox them, and then bring them home and you know, type them all out. No, type is the wrong word, whatever the word is. <laughs> Anyhow, transcribe them. So that's what I was doing <laughs> over all of this, this long period of time. And, um, that was, the in, that was the inspiration for me, uh, the letters, actually. So that when I went to put together the biography and I had this wealth of letters collected, I wanted to use them. At one point I thought, perhaps this book should be titled The Life and Letters of Flora Stone Mather. Now my editor had another view of this. <laughs> she, uh, she intervened and um, her name is Joanna Hildebrand Craig and she's not here today um, for family reasons. But she worked with me in a way that incorporated the letters. I mean, we ha I had to give up some parts of the letters. <laughs> that was not easy for me. But we did, and it, I think it's a much better and a tighter book, and, and I'm, I'm satisfied with it. Although it was really hard. It was like giving up a part of Flora, you know, to give up her letters. But I wanted to... Um, it stressed the importance of the letters. And those who have read this um, biography, uh, we have readers. Uh, they, both the readers uh, and their comments you'll find on the back of the book when you have it in your hand. They, all, uh, they both mentioned the letters, the importance of the letters, because as historians they recognize this is absolutely sublime, sublime primary source material. Now, I have uh, some things that I want to um, quote from the book. Um, and they're, you won't be surprised, they're letters. <laughs> I used uh, epigraphs in the construction of this book for the opening of, of each chapter. And the one that I want to share with you to open is right um, in the chapter that's stated preface and acknowledgments. And this is what it reads. It's Flora Stone Mather's voice. I feel so strongly that I am one of God's stewards. 
large means without effort of mine have been put into my hands, and I must use them as my heavenly Father would have me, and as my dear earthly Father would have me, were he here. Now this is what, what you will want to keep in mind as you're moving through this biography. That is the heart of the matter for Flora. And if you understand that, then everything else will fall into place. And that's why it is placed in the preface, just to you know, give you the, the proper send-off. The prologue is entitled The Singularity of Flora Stone Mather. And I'm going to read just one paragraph, because I want the major players in her life to be um, uh, very uh, clearly uh, named and described for you. Flora Stone was the daughter of New England-born entrepreneur Amasa Stone, a student of Mount Holyoke trained Linda Guilford, a parishioner of the First Presbyterian Church's Reverend William Henry Goodrich, and pastor educator Hiram C. Hayden, and the wife of New England distinguished descendant industrialist philanthropist Samuel Mather. Within home, school, church, and marriage, Flora Stone Mather acquired those values that supported her advocacy for education and social welfare and profoundly influenced the quality and character of her efforts. This next quote uh, is one from Samuel Mather to Flora. Now their, their uh, relationship began uh, when they were very, very young. They were neighbors on Euclid Avenue. And so they grew up three, three doors away from each other. And so as they moved through their adolescent years, they were always in touch. But then it blossomed into a romance. And it was, a, it was a very deep love affair, a very passionate love affair. And when you read the letters, you'll see how, in their wonderful 19th century language, they express it. Samuel, to Flora Stone, I love your conscientious devotion to duty, your untiring energy and cheerfulness of spirit. Now, that's what Samuel, that was his way of expressing his admiration for her. Notice duty, <laughs> cheerfulness of spirit. He had his downtimes, Samuel Mather. He, he could be a little grim. <laughs> not, not necessarily an easy guy to live with. But <laughs> then Flora wrote to him, um, and she said, this is, these are all excerpts, you understand. She wrote to him, and she said, what touched me most and made me most glad of you was that you said we would try together to live naturally, truthfully, humbly striving to improve ourselves and to be of some honest use. That's it. <laughs> Now, when I was describing the four major influences on uh, Flora, one of them was her teacher, Linda Thayer Guilford. And Flora um, attended her school, graduated from Miss Guilford's Academy, as it was called for short. It was really officially the Cleveland Academy. And she, they remained friends throughout Flora's life. And she turned to, Flora turned to Linda Thayer Guilford to talk about all kinds of intimate things that were related to family life. And this is an example of it. This is Flora writing to Linda Guilford, whose house we are, well, house name for her, I should say. This is Flora now. It is true what you say that my greatest gift to the next century would be my well-trained children. I say would be. For the responsibility, that is the wrong word here, is so much more difficult than anything else that I sometimes cry out, but I cannot do it. It is so much for me. 
But then I think, what if I should give it up? What if the Lord should take me at my word? And then I begin again to try and discipline myself to discipline them with patient love. And then this last one from um, Hiram C. Hayden, it's a in memoriam to uh, Flora. And once again, as her pastor and also uh, he was president of Western Reserve University, Pres uh, at, he was her pastor at Old Stone First Presbyterian Church and president of uh, Western Reserve University. And this is what he said about her. Beyond anything under my observation, stewardship with her was a reality. She held her trust and her ability to do great and little things as well from God. This was the secret of that studiousness which she gave to her benevolent work and of her desire to know, as far as she might, the recipients of her favors. She was known for her involvement with students. She was known for her involvement what, in whatever the agency was that she had either founded or participated in as one of the founders. And what that means is she put forth money, she sat on the boards, she was interacting with the clients as well as the staff. Now, you don't get more totally involved than that. She did it, she did it all, and so that's why uh, uh, Hiram C. Hayden's uh, memorial to her is so, uh, is so appropriate. Now I thought maybe you'd like to ask some questions, and I welcome them. Christ, you know the quote that, uh, that was Molly's favorite, which was, each day she gave herself. Uh, I'm not sure whether that came from her husband, Samuel, at her at her death, or, or it might have been Dr. Cry, but it was each day she gave herself. She said that so often that I can't, I can't okay. pinpoint it. It could be in several places, but I do know that that was Molly. Yeah. And Molly, the contemporary Flora Stone man who is well chosen. I noticed, Glenda, that you, you dwelt on that at the very end by the quote on the fireplace of Charlie, right. which is an elaboration of that very same quote. Yes. Yes. This is just a comment that there also was a dormitory on campus named in her honor called Mather House, and it was a co-op dorm, and you had to keep a certain grade point average to live in that dormitory. Uh, and for those of us who were lucky enough to do that, uh, we felt an especial kinship to Floristone Mather. That's good. The building is still here. Yes, but it's, it's not, not a dormitory. No, anymore. no, it's not a dormitory. It's, it holds it's off. Right right it's right next door. Next door. This way. Yes. Yeah, it still says Mather House on it. Did you share a little bit of her uh, interest in the Goodrich House? Yes. The Goodrich, um, the Goodrich Gannett, um, well, we have to begin with Goodrich House. Um, she, um, it was a settlement house, and it was really an extension of the Old Stone Church and the population that. Uh, uh, they were serving, but they needed to have a better building. And so she provided the money for this building. And uh, it's, <laughs> it's in a different location now, but where it was originally, it looked like a mansion. And people commented about that because they thought, if this is going to be a social settlement, wouldn't this be a little you know, put people off and think, oh my, this is not a place where I would be comfortable. Didn't turn out to be that way at all. People came there, but the beauty of that whole experience was that the Floristone Mather, the, the College for Women, I have to be careful about that because she would never allow her name to be used for any, any building, any. It wasn't until uh, her husband, who was on the board of trustees, was ailing, and uh, the 
<coughs> the trustees approached him and said, you know, we have always wanted to have um, the college name for Flora. And uh, he said, um, the Flora Stone Mather alumni are the ones who should be given the opportunity to name this because he, had, he knew that Flora never wanted anything to be named for her, and he honored her request. So that when uh, this happened, the Flora Stone Mather alumni, who had been asking for a very long time to have her name be given, it was honored at that time. And then a year later, uh, uh, Samuel Mather died. So, um, but back now to Goodrich. So the beauty of that whole experience was that as, a, as it was a settlement, but it was a college settlement, which meant that the girls from the College for Women went there and were involved in it. Now, this is something that came right from New York, where they had these kinds of um, uh, involvements. And also, the woman who came was a friend of Flora's, and she basically designed the, the, uh, the program. It was very successful. So you had this kind of, what do we call it today, work study. Uh, but the connection I want to make for you now about that is that just on August 21st, Goodrich Gannett opened the Flora Stone Mather Early Childhood and Family Service Center. And this was an extraordinary experience to be there for this, for this dedication. After, I mean, they had every possible dignitary there, from the governor, the mayor, the councilman. They were all there celebrating this. Now, this is a major thing to have happen in a neighborhood. I mean, really major. And here was Goodrich Gannett in the first place, and then this, another building, a beautiful building, very close by. We had a tour of it afterwards, and as I was walking around, I saw all these young women. They were standing in, in each room as we went through, and these are the rooms with the children, and they're little, very young children, and, and parents uh, could come for the kind of help that they were offering. So I said to these students, they were students, I thought, I said, what is your job here? And they said, oh, we're involved with, um, you know, being um, teachers for, for the children. And I said, really? Well, tell me about your background. They said, we're graduates of Case Western Reserve University. And they were involved with the program out of the city of Cleveland to serve in, these, in this capacity in working with these children. Now, if that isn't a complete, you know, things coming around full circle, you see, it's just, it's so, it's just so well grounded in the, um, the philosophy of Flora Stone Mather and the way it's been carried out and implemented and everything, and it keeps going on. I think that's just the beauty of it. Ted and Ted. Yes. And her husband. And they were on a lot of uh, controversial issues as to mission and and I'm curious uh, what what you discovered in all those letters from uh, from that <laughs> interesting relationship. <laughs> I just love this when a member of the family asks me these kinds of things. All right. Don't Ken? <laughs> okay. Sense some excitement. You said no, you're right. Well, Clara Stone, Clara Stone, Flora's sister, Clara Stone, um, her older sister, uh, married John Hay. And John Hay is familiar to you as a, uh, a, a, a diplomat, a journalist, and um, he also held some very high positions in, um, at the national level in government. Well. He was quite a bit older than Clara when they married, but he pursued her and to Cleveland. He met her in New York in, uh, at fl in, in uh, Clara, and, um, uh, f at Clara and Flora's uncle's home. And um, he pursued her to Cleveland. And um, 
the family, the parents, were not thrilled about this whole, not just because he was older, but it was even more poignant than that. They never really got over the loss, the death of their son, Adelbert. He was drowned as a young man, a student, and the effect of that on the family, and particularly Amasa Stone, his wife, I know, felt it just as deeply, but she handled it a little bit better. He did not. It actually affected him and contributed, <coughs> along with a number of other things, but contributed very, very much to his suicide. So when um, Clara wanted to marry, both, both Clara, uh, um, Julia, their mother, and Amister, were, were Amister, Amister Stone were loath to let her marry. They postponed the engagement. Well, they finally let that finally. Then they postponed the marriage, and then they finally let it happen. Well, Clara was a good match for him, and John Hay was a very wise man because Clara inherited, just as Flora did, equally with the inheritance. And Clara chose to bankroll her husband. They lived very well. They had one home that was right next to Amos' stones. He built it right there for them, next door. He's going to hold on to those kids. Like you said, he had to build a house for his hay. <laughs> that's right. That's exactly right. That is, that is, that's right. Um, and so, and Clara was not uh, forthcoming in, at all in the way that, that Flora was. She wasn't, she wasn't, uh, she didn't have that same kind of impulse to serve in that way, um, with one exception. If it had anything to do with honoring their father, then she would, she would help. So that's the answer to, to it. And uh, John Hay was a very successful man. He died early. He actually was brought to Cleveland by uh, Amazon Stone to help him with the business. I mean, Amazon Stone was a very powerful man. And he brought him, made the house that Diane just right next door to his, got him to help with the business. And it wasn't John Hay's thing at all. He was not a businessman. Made him sick. He had a lot of difficulty with it, and it made him ill. So there you go. Is, it, is that I'm enough? I'm not going to read the whole thing. <laughs> 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 Go ahead. I, I hope you. Even your summarized, right? <laughs> yeah. You captured the essence. The essence, of yeah. Okay. <laughs> Diane? Um, when you're glowing about how special she was, uh, and even though she wasn't quite in the same generation as Lucy's grandmother, Miss um, Lippling Mather, but both of these women always stopped me still with how systemic their thinking was. They, they were not interested in superficial solutions. They, um, can you talk a little bit about how it wasn't, I mean, she was a terrific board member because uh, she really delved into the way things were um, and wanted to know not just how to throw money at a problem, but how to, to really change the gears. Well, where that impulse comes from, I, I think I've, I touched on enough so that you have a sense of it. it. She was very spiritually and faithfully based. That was really where she was, she was coming from. And so her whole idea of service is what carried her forward in everything she did. She was greatly admired by her circle of friends. And who were her friends? They were the Euclid Avenue crowd. She'd grown up with them. And so when she took on a task, she invited them to join her, and they all did. And when you read the book, you'll see why the women were so attracted to her. She was small. She had these great dark eyes, and people were just very drawn to her. When she was a little girl at the Cleveland Academy, it's quoted in the book, one of her classmates said, wait until Flora comes. She'll know just how to go ahead. <laughs> So her leadership abilities were really 
recognized by her peers at a young age, a very young age. So I believe in, and that's why the, f the first couple of things that I read to you, um, I chose them specifically to try to convey um, what motivated her. And when you, when you read the, the uh, biography, you'll have much more detail for that. 